Afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being here with us today. I'm Katie Earl. I coordinate our University Express program, and we're joined with Ian Sapala from the Herschel Carousel Factory Museum. Welcome, Ian. Hi, everybody. We're glad you're here. So we are recording the session, as you just heard. I'll try to post it on our website in the near future. If you have any questions for Ian as he's going through his presentation, put it in that good old Q&A panel that I think you're mostly familiar with by now, but quickly, it's located at the lower right-hand side of your screen. If you're on a computer, click on it, expand it, you'll see the text box, send your questions to me. And then if you're on a tablet or smartphone, touch your screen, that brings up your control panel. You'll see your Q&A and same thing, text box, send your questions to me. So quickly, we'll thank our sponsors, which is our Department of Senior Services, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York, Celsius Orthopedics and Wegmans for all their support. And we're 858-8526 here at Senior Services if you ever need anything. All right, the star of our show. Ian is the interim director of the Herschel Carousel Factory Museum. He was previously the education director there. His previous employers include the Rochester Museum and Science Center and the Historic Ships of Baltimore. He possesses a bachelor's degree in history from SUNY Brockport and a master's degree in museum studies and historic preservation from Morgan State University. He runs the museum's blog, The Carousel Courier, which includes scholarly articles, book reviews, volunteer experiences, and more. And he does a lot there as interim director. So Ian, thank you for taking time today. The floor is yours. It's my pleasure. Hi, everyone. Um, as a wonderful introduction there from uh, Catherine there. Um, I have some secret news to tell all of you today um, as of this morning. Uh, you can remove that interim label off of that tag. So you are the first people to find out, other than my staff, that you are now speaking to the uh, executive director of the Herschel Carousel Factory Museum here in North Tonawanda, New York. Uh, so I'm here with you today to talk about the history of Tonawanda amusement. Um, so we're gonna use Tonawanda in general because the city of North Tonawanda doesn't come around until much later. Um, and even though it was being built in the area we now know as North Tonawanda, some of these first companies were actually uh, known as Tonawanda companies. Um, now, we have a lot to go through and little time to do it in. If you do have questions, please send them to me. I'd be more than happy to derail for anything that we're actually interested in because we're covering over 100 years of history here um, in about 45 minutes because I like to give you plenty of time for questions. And I did bring some really fun historical props with me as well um, that I'd like to show you if we do have the time as well. So what we see here on the first page, other than uh, my name there, is actually a photograph of the museum as it is today. We do have still the red uh, with the white lettering and our newest logo, which came into place in 2020, which has our lead horse there, King Billy, and the uh, original script from one of the four companies. So if I get the next slide there, please. All right, so we're actually going to talk about four separate carousel companies today, and then we are also going to talk about some uh, some music. Um, all of those things were done uh, within North Tonawanda um, and Tonawanda in general. You can actually see in the bottom corner there that it still says Tonawanda. So the first company is the Armitage Herschel Company. This company actually starts making uh, steam powered farming equipment. Um, so if we have any uh, country fellows such as myself grew up in the middle of nowhere. You'll uh, know what a silage cutter is um, and some other equipment that will help out with animals um, and with tractors. This is the type of equipment that the company is originally making. Um, Alan Herschel, who is the Herschel part of the Armitage Herschel Company, in 1878 goes down to New York City um, to see a uh, doctor for a medical condition he has. When he goes down there, he sees this machine powered by uh, steam, created by wood, that adults are lining up down the street to, to ride. He doesn't really know what it is, but he can smell a good business opportunity um, when he can see one. Uh, so he decides to uh, jot down some notes and takes this machine he has seen to his partner, uh, George Armitage, and says, we should start making these. George says, you can make one, they make one in 1878. It is sold to the then mayor of Attica, New York, um, and it is a huge success. By the end of 1880, 90% of the company is now making these machines. Um, it just absolutely blows up. It's an amazing thing that people start being very interested in. 
Um, notice how I've been very careful not to use the word carousel. That's because these aren't carousels to begin with. Um, they are known as steam riding galleries. So you can actually see that in my uh, little photo at the bottom there. Um, and that's actually what the uh, flag there says. Um, that is one of the uh, first in color um, uh, marketing pieces that we have from the Armitage Herschel uh, company. Uh, and that shows that this is a steam riding gallery. So steam riding galleries have one big difference from the carousels that we all know and love. And that is that they uh, do not actually work by using a pole. So if you look at the horse in the top right corner there, it is on a pole underneath. And that's admittedly because at a carousel museum, I don't know how to hang anything else. Um, I have to use poles. That's just what we do for everything. But it actually doesn't have a pole hole that goes all the way through. So these horses actually rest on a wooden beam that comes from inside the machine. And then it actually rocks back and forth. That's the motion. So it goes around a track and then it rocks back and forth. So these are track machines, um, not uh, machines that are using our uh, swinging trusses above, like the machines you guys know today. There still is one of these that exists today um, and it's still operated uh, in operational fashion. That is in South Dakota. I believe they're called Pioneer Land. Um, or Frontierland. They changed their name recently, and I don't remember which one's the new one and which one's the old one. But it's still fully functional out in South Dakota. If you want to ride a um, pre-1900s machine that is still powered by steam engines, that's the place to do it. And that was built right here in the Tonawandas. Um, next slide, please. So George Armitage ends up retiring, um, and Alan Herschel looks for new partners. He does so uh, kind of close to home and finds Ed Spillman, who happens to be his brother-in-law. Um, so the Herschel Spillman Company is born. Uh, this is the early 1920s. We're getting right into the beginning of the golden age of carousels. I have an example of a couple of horses there. Um, the Herschel Spillman Company is known for uh, being one of the first companies in the United States to actually do the up and down motion of the carousels you guys know and love today. Um, they're also known um, for making the process of building carousels faster. Um, so they create what is known as the box technique, which is actually using uh, layers in the horse and then, um, and then kind of putting it all in a box style to make it faster to produce. And all of their pieces are actually done using an assembly line. So I have a horse uh, leg here. It's going to be hard to see because it's a small screen. Ooh, it's really big. But these horse legs here are actually carved uh, by the uh, apprentice carvers. So those are the youngest carvers. Um, at that point, these carvers would have been 13 to 15 years of age, uh, working about 14 hour days. And their entire job is to make four to six of these a day. So they're using an assembly line, which allows them to make these things a lot faster. Um, it does create what some people would call um, uh, boring horses. Um, I wouldn't call them that. They have their own character. They are still hand done, um, but they are done through a process that makes them uh, more similar than they are not. They still use, they use patterns and they're trying to get these out as fast as possible because we do remember it as a business. So the legs are really fun to do there. Um, and all of this work is done first on a saw, and then it is done use, or by a carver. So carving is all of the detail that you see in the pieces here. Um, and that is done using a couple of things. Um, so the one thing it's using is uh, carving knives. So these look like gouges or uh, sharp on one end and smooth on the others. I usually have a set, um, but we're actually teaching part of our uh, carving course right now. Um, so we actually teach it usually twice a year um, in the spring and in the fall. So we do have a fall class coming up if anyone wants to join uh, beginner and advanced courses. And for the first time, we have an intermediate level as well. Um, but we're right now just trying to uh, finish up the last class that got interrupted with COVID. Um, you'd also use a mallet here and Spillman Engineering Company uses these as well. A mallet is an innovation. It sounds funny when I use it as a word as an innovation, something we've all known for our lives. And it is not a lint roller um, for those that ask, the kids usually ask. Um, 
it's used to allow to move more wood quickly so we can get through the stuff faster. Um, and we can we can stay on this foam and engineering one uh, there, Katie, because we're moving on to them. And they all use, all four of these companies use a similar techniques, just like talking about it then. Um, so what happens eventually is that the Herschel Spillman company is renamed to Spillman Engineering. Um, they start making things that aren't just carousels. Uh, they actually start making a bunch of engines uh, that are used to, these engines are used in tractors, they're used in trailers and in large trucks. Um, they actually also start making boat engines as well. Um, actually, uh, another plug, um, one of our uh, volunteers, uh, John D, is actually giving an entire tour just based on engines this Saturday. It is no additional cost uh, for you to come and see it here. It's just the regular cost of admission, which is $10 for adults and $5 for seniors and kids. Um, the Spillman Engineering Corporation from 1920 to 1945 also starts making much larger, much beautiful, uh, or more decorated animals. Um, and I showed you this photo, um, and you look at it, and you might think, uh, well, that's why, why would Ian show us this photo with all this kind of clutter around and stuff like that? That's kind of a weird photograph. Um, I use this photograph for a very specific reason, and that is because of our friends that have come on downtown. Um, I'll answer this first and then I'm, uh, I'll take any questions. We'll pause here for any questions. But um, the question that I'm going to answer for you before you ask is the uh, carousel downtown is from the Buffalo Heritage Carousel. It is a separate organization that we helped. So we help them restore their animals. Uh, we help them fix their band organ and provide them some assistance um, when we can. Uh, but they are two, we are two separate groups. And, but their org, or, but their carousel is a Spillman Engineering Corporation carousel. It was built in 1924. And this is the lion that was restored uh, by some of my volunteers and by that group that you can now ride with your families downtown. Um, so I like showing the photo of this as it's just recently been uh, taken care of and it's recently been restored before it even went on a carousel at that point. So it looks like, do we have a question there? Oh, there it is. I found it. Is okay. the carving class only in person or is it virtual too? My brother loves carving, but he lives out of state. Thanks. Thank you, Linda. So short answer um, is it is only in person. Long answer is that we are currently in process to hopefully being able to offer not a full carving class, but a series of carving lessons virtually. So these will be smaller lessons that your brother would be able to look at, go back, check again, um, things as simple as uh, how to clean your tools. Um, what tools do you need? Um, and safety precautions, um, as well as some of the more complex uh, ideas. Um, so we are going to start with, uh, we are going to start with trying to do that virtually in 2022. So that's a great question, um, but that's the uh, that's the plan uh, for for next time. Awesome, Ian. I'm not sure if you're seeing this one. It might have just been to me, but it says I think the merry-go-round was steam powered at Crystal Beach. Okay, so um, originally it is steam powered at Crystal Beach, and they did still have their steam engine there, um, but uh, by the uh, by the time that most of us would have been riding that there, and I should, should, shouldn't should include myself in that conversation, not to uh, make anybody feel old, um, but I'll tell, remind me, someone please send me a question and remind me. I'll tell you my family Crystal, Crystal Beach stories at the end, because I have quite a few actually. But um, by, the, uh, by the 30s, that is using an electric motor. Um, so previous that the, it could use steam power, they had a steam engine there, but it was electric power for most of the time that most people would have been there. Yeah, I did cool. not see that one, so thank you. Yep, yeah. and that's all I'm seeing right now. Wonderful. All right, we can move on to the, the last but not least company there, one that has uh, my namesake for it. This is the Allen Herschel Company. So 
Um, as you can see, there's a historic photo of my building, um, which has all of the uh, train tracks in front of it still. Those are now where you park your car. Um, but historically, uh, the everything that was built at the museum would be able to uh, be taken immediately put on a train car and sent uh, to all 50 states, every province in Canada, um, Mexico, and over 43 other countries in the world. Um, so the Allen Herschel Company, how this works is Allen Herschel retires from the Herschel Spillman Company in 1913. Um, he battled uh, some illnesses throughout his entire life, um, and in and it was very difficult for him to take care of. So uh, he retired, and but in 1915, he wants to get back in the business. Instead of going back and working with his brother-in-law again, he sets up two blocks down the street from the Herschel Spillman Company. He creates the Allen Herschel Company, their direct type competitor. He also takes about 50% of all of their employees with him. Um, and it becomes a really big rivalry. Uh, that company, the Allen Herschel Company Incorporated, um, was actually installed in the building that I'm sitting in today. Um, we are the only carousel museum in the entire world built in the original factory. So it's a really interesting thing. Parts of our building are from 1885 on up. Um, so the Allen Herschel Company was also known for menagerie animals, like the earlier ones were. I had to throw in my favorite menagerie animal that we have at the museum, that is the rooster. Um, I do, I despise uh, chickens and roosters in real life, but the detail on this rooster is so amazing that I, I can't ignore it. Um, every fletching or every little spot done on the uh, feathers is all done by hand. Um, and it takes uh, two weeks for the carvers to actually fully carve a rooster when they can do three horses every two days to show you the difference. Um, the uh, photo in the bottom left there of all the guys working, that is our carving floor in 1919. That's a photo that was taken on site. And when you come to the museum, you can actually stand in the same places those people are standing um, and actually are able to see the photo and see how it would have looked then um, compared to some of the things we have in there now. We do have a lot of the historical tools and desks and things like that in our facility. Moved around a little bit um, because we don't want anyone to get their hands stuck in a bandsaw, but um, it is, uh, we do have a lot of that stuff still available and you can stand right in those rooms. Um, in the 1940s, the Allen Herschel Company starts actually making rides that aren't carousels as well. Um, so they patent this thing called Kitty Land, which are children's rides. Um, and it's a specific little park just for kitty rides that you can actually put right in the middle of another park. Um, it's a built up park. So one of the, my favorite rides is the Brownie Tractor Ride, as you see below. So it is a, a full, you can go anywhere in this little pen tractor, um, made mostly for children to actually drive, even though this one shows that an adult is with them. Um, and this is used more at rural theme parks and things of that nature. This is one of the first rides that was purchased by Darien Amusement, which is now known as Six Flags Darien Lake. So the Allen Herschel Company is the one we look at the most. They actually move in 1959 to Buffalo. Um, and then in 1969, they are sold to Chance Manufacturing out of Wichita, Kansas. Chance still makes rides today, and they are called, all their carousels are called Allen Herschel style carousels. So our name is so renowned that over 50 years after the company is gone, they're still using our branding. So it's a really interesting thing. Um, I'm gonna move on to the music stuff in just a second here. Does anyone have any carousel questions they really wanna talk about before we move on to some music? I'll, I'll pause here for just a second. Um, if you'd like to move on to the next slide, that's great. That's a good stopping spot. Let's see if we got any more coming in. Wonderful. So um, North Tonawanda music. So I, I put the North in here on purpose. Um, that is because uh, the main company that we're gonna talk about Two companies we're gonna I'm gonna talk about briefly are going to be after North Tonawanda becomes an actual city. 
Um, and that's and that's why I'm including that. Um, the building you're looking at uh, is uh, part of the uh, Wurlitzer complex. It actually is the North Tonawanda Musical Instrument Works Company, which is a mouthful um, building, uh, which was actually a building that was first up and then the Wurlitzer complex was put around it. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the music real quick. We have to keep in mind that the music uh, that came to and was developed in North Tonawanda is all because of the amusement that's already being built here. So the Alan Herschel brings these other people in to have music being built right next to them, things that can be uh, taken together and put together. These are separate companies, but there's a lot of synergy, uh, new age word. There's a lot of, uh, there's, there's a lot of cooperation between the two. Um, depending on the time period between the three or four or five. All right. Um, Linda, I'm gonna answer your question right before we get into the history here. Where are there more North Tonawanda carousels located in the United States? There is one in Buffalo, Wyoming. Um, there's now one also located in Buffalo, New York. Um, if I went through where all of them were located, one, I don't have them all memorized. And two, that would take up the rest of our time with us together. What I am going to uh, state is uh, there is the National Carousel Association, or NCA. They're a wonderful resource. They have their own online census um, that allows you to actually check and see where all of these are. Um, I'll give you a couple highlight ones. Uh, so the goal of uh, the Golden Gate Bridge Park in San Francisco has an Alan Herschel carousel. Um, the Smithsonian carousel in Washington, D.C. Um, is, uh, is an Alan Herschel carousel. And the first desegregated carousel, which still exists in Maryland, the first ever desegregated carousel is also a, a, a North Tonawanda carousel. Um, there are over 100 that are still operational in the United States. And many more that I know that are in storage, either privately or not. Um, and those uh, are all available to, uh, those are all being restored. So they're hopefully will be available to be written in, in the near future. Um, so uh, we're gonna move on to the uh, amusement or to the organs here, and we'll get to the rest of the um, questions here uh, when we get to the end. So the history is, as we talked about, Alan Herschel's creating amusement rides. Um, first, he's importing barrel organs to go with these machines. Um, so if you've ever uh, had a music box and opened it up, it operates by having these metal uh, tinges that actually connect together. And when they hit, when the right ones hit, they will play certain notes. And it's all created that way, a mechanical way of making music. Barrel organs are the same way, but on a much larger scale. So this is a four and a half foot barrel, wooden barrel, that has uh, metal pins that look like staples put in it. Um, we have a photo of that a little bit later that you'll actually be able to see. He's importing these from, uh, from England, the Netherlands, um, and uh, Germanic uh, states. Um, eventually, he's going to want them to be produced here because of high tariffs on imported goods. Uh, next slide, please. All right, and how he does that is he finds Eugene de Kleist. Um, so Eugene um, is a Bavarian uh, gentleman who is working in the music business in England. Alan Herschel goes over there to start getting some of the uh, connections he's looking for. Um, and he starts telling all of the people that work over there, if you move to the United States to make these organs, I will build you a factory and sell it to you for a dollar as long as you come and you sell this stuff to me. So a lot of people, you know, say, oh yeah, I'll come, I'll show up, yeah, whatever. Um, but Eugene de Kleist is the only one to do it. So Eugene de Kleist, uh, a single man at this time says, I think that's a great opportunity, let me do that. So he packs up his entire life and moves to North Tonawanda, New York, as it is at the time, um, and, uh, and creates this company. Um, originally known as the uh, as the Kleist Music Instrument Works, it then becomes North Tonawanda Barrel Organ Factory and North Tonawanda Musical Instrument Works. Lots of fun names. 
Um, he starts in 1893, and what you see on here is the uh, museum's North Tonawanda Barrel Organ. It's from 1895, and it is fully functional. So uh, the museum is open to the public. Um, we uh, are changing our COVID policies weekly, so make sure you call or check, and there's information at the end to do so on what we're doing at the moment. Uh, we wanna make sure everyone's safe, of course. So, um, but come to the museum, be more than happy to show these and play and play all the stuff I'm talking about for you. Um, we have uh, over uh, six functioning organs at the museum, including this uh, barrel organ, which is from 1895. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So it did sell its own equipment to uh, to private people, and but it mostly did contract work. So it did contract work to uh, the Herschel companies at the time. So right, so at that point, that's Armitage Herschel. Um, but he also works for this company called the Rudolph Wurlitzer Company. Um, and the Kleist eventually actually sells the company and the plants here in North Tonawanda to the Wurlitzer Company in 1909. Um, so let's, uh, let's talk about the Wurlitzer company next and their kind of meager beginnings. Next slide, please. So Rudolf Wurlitzer, um, it's now Germany. He was born in 1831. It's now Germany. He, uh, considered himself Austrian, Austrian, Austro-Hungarian at the time though. Um, and he actually moves to, uh, the United States, um, in his early teens. And he actually settles in Cincinnati, Ohio, of all places, and creates a, a music business. Now, the Wurlitzer Company that you know, uh, arguably still today, they're still around, um, just owned by the Baldwin Piano Company. They're mostly known for their jukeboxes, um, for their uh, beautiful theater organs, like the one that is here at the Riviera in North Tonawanda as well. Um, and they're known for all kinds of other things. But the first thing that Rudolf Wurlitzer was actually doing is he was importing Austrian uh, instruments like violins and cellos that were made in poor quality in the United States. And he was getting them for cheap from his cousins and family that still lived in Austria and then selling them in the United States at, this, at a much higher market rate because they weren't made at the same quality here. Um, so that's what he starts doing. Then he starts buying these other organs and things from people that are in the United States and in Europe. He's still buying them. And that's how he finds De Kleist's company here in North Tonawanda. So another thing about Eugene De Kleist um, is that he was a very popular person. Um, he was popular with the people of North Tonawanda. He was elected mayor at one point. Um, he was popular uh, with his neighbors. A lot of people enjoyed him. Um, and he was also popular with ladies, um, especially if it's not his wife. Um, so uh, he had a lot of things going on and he was starting to run behind in his, uh, with his actual company. Um, and just wasn't paying as much attention to that. He'd start, he had made enough money. It wasn't his major focus anymore. Uh, Rudolf Wurlitzer had four sons. He sent three of them to come see Mr. DeKleist with an ultimatum either start producing the things you told me you would or sell me your company. So he ends up selling uh, the manufacturing uh, to the Rudolf Wurlitzer company. And he ends up being able to live a long life doing uh, whatever he wants and having uh, a lot of fun doing it. Um, Rudolf takes his second son, Farney, and puts him in charge here in North Tonawanda. Barney uh, revolutionizes how these instruments are made. He makes them at a much larger scale. Um, there are over 800 employees at the World's Air Factory in North Tonawanda at one point. Um, they produced all of the band organs that were ever made in the United States. There was no other city that made them. Um, at one point, it is suggested that there is uh, a Wurlitzer organ at uh, three out of every four amusement parks in the United States, um, which remember these amusement parks at one point were at least one in every small city. Um, in places like Western New York, we had seven, eight, nine, ten at a time. Um, and each one of these had one of these machines and the roles that it actually did. Uh, next slide, please. 
So he had 2,000 people in the 1930s. I underestimate when I don't have the numbers in front of me. Um, he had 800 in the uh, in the band organ department alone. Um, so I do have a YouTube clip there. We're not going to watch it today. I do have an entire series um, on our YouTube that actually is um, myself and other employees breaking down what we have here at the museum. They are very short. They are 45 seconds to a minute and a half in length. And just tell you about one special item here and some cool things about it, and then we see it in action. Um, it's called the Carousel Curiosity Series. Um, and I currently have over 10 of them. Uh, I think we have 11 right now that are up. Um, and season two will be starting this fall. Um, so the Alan Kurt Herschel Company actually purchased the band organ division from uh, Rudolf Wurlitzer in the 1930s. Um, because Wurlitzer was moving on to bigger and better things like Nickelodeons, which are the player pianos that you use a nickel to play, um, and then the early forms of jukeboxes. So they're moving on to bigger and better things, uh, but the people that are using the Alan Herschel equipment are still using this older technology. So the Alan Herschel company buys it off of them. And that's how we get the next thing. Next slide, please, which is our Band organs. So these are two that are here at the museum. Um, the one on the left that you can see is a Wurlitzer 125 military band organ. It has the horns there. I actually have three of these. Um, one of them was donated to us within the last month. Um, and it actually is a converted one, which is really cool for us at least. Um, so it originally was actually a barrel organ like the photo we saw earlier. And then it was later converted into this. So it, its dimensions are kind of different. It's got some weird kind of things to it. It's got some cool signage um, that they put on it originally, but um, that is a really interesting one. Um, and then the other uh, two that we have, one is fully restored um, and the other one uh, we are just starting to do now. Um, and so you can see them in various stages and, and they all fully play. Um, well, two of the three play of those. So you can come to the museum and listen to those as well. The one on the other side, the white one there is a Wurlitzer Caliola. Um, this one, uh, ours is actually green. And the Caliola is really rare because it uses the rolls, as you can see there um, on the back, but it also has a full keyboard in the back. So it's the only band organ that you can actually play using the keys and also play using the rolls. So I've got an example of the master roll here. We're gonna talk about this at the next slide, but this is actually how our uh, roles are able to be read. All right, next slide, please. Thank you. So this is our other two organs. This is the World Tour 146 that we have at the museum. Um, and then the 153, which is on the right, is the one that's for the uh, the Buffalo Heritage Carousel Group. Um, it is no longer on display at our museum. It's now in the carousel, which is fully operational down there. So those that's that's what we have. Next slide, please. All right, this is an Artisan D organ as shown at our museum. It is one of the competing companies from Wurlitzer. Artisan was a really interesting company. It was three guys who had worked for the Artisan or the Wurlitzer company for six, seven years and said, we don't want to work for them anymore. Uh, left and set up a competing shop literally across the street. Um, they changed everything just enough so they would get past Wurlitzer's patents and created uh, these very beautiful ornate organs such as the D model, which is this one. It is the largest organ that the museum has. It has 203 pipes. Um, so it is uh, very loud. It's an organ that we actually play outside during the summertime. So if you come here, you'll actually hear it outdoors. Because um, if we play it inside, we actually need to wear headphones um, because it is that loud. Um, a couple of my volunteers, they joke that band organs have two different, uh, two different uh, sound levels. Uh, loud and louder. Um, so they definitely are one that we have to uh, to work at with that. Um, 
and yes, Linda, the uh, Traverse City Museum of Music, there's actually multiple Wurlitzer organs uh, in the museum itself. Um, so I actually know the uh, director over from the Museum of Music. They've got quite a few. And as we're going to see with our uh, perforator stuff in a second, we actually have sent them some functioning roles so they can continue operating over there. Next slide, please. All right, this is when we brought the artisan home. So it, we actually were able to uh, purchase it um, through donations. Um, the museum uh, thrives and survives off of people's generosity, if that is through grants, like from the Ralph D. Wilson F Jr. Foundation, or if it's from local uh, and uh, interested parties such as yourselves. Um, donations are how we're able to keep everything going and how we're able to bring in new things and keep them preserved. So next slide, please. All right. So the perforator is the machine that would print the rolls for these. We have the only functioning one left in the world. Um, yeah, and how we do that is we take these master rolls. So this is a cut example that I have. Um, but these are, uh, we actually have 1300 original ones. Um, all of these holes you see here, these are separate notes, okay? So each of these is a different note. And if you notice, if they're longer over here or shorter over here, that's how long or short the note plays. So then this is put on to the top of the machine and we can actually make copies of that for these roll into these rolls. And then those rolls are used on the organs. Next slide, please. I should have a nice big photo of our perforator coming up. There it is in all its glory. So this is a uh, this is actually part of our Wurlitzer uh, display area here. If you see the top uh, rolls at the top, uh, and the rolls in the back actually are our master rolls I was talking about, where a part of this uh, was able to come from. Um, it's put on the top there, uh, and then the machine operates. If you're staring at the screen, it is left where that big roll of paper is to the right, where the end looks kind of uh, like it's a series of bars that move. Um, so it actually will print, will actually punch out all of the holes underneath. So we have the same thing. To perforate means the punch holes. So we just have a very heavy, very rare hole punch um, that does a very specific job. Um, it will not punch your your regular papers. Um, so if I could have the next slide, please. Wonderful. So we now, as I said, over five. As of last month, I have six uh, band organs um, that are fully operational. Um, we're up to seven that we actually have. We have the perforator and other equipment. Um, we're currently restoring a BAB perforator, which means that we can actually make all of the, uh, we can actually make all of the rolls for the other competing companies after we fix this. Um, so currently, if you have an artisan organ like we do, um, you can't get any new rolls. No one makes them, no one fixes them. So this BAB perforator, which we have the uh, only, we, well, there's a few of them in existence, but we're the only one that's attempting to get ours to work. Um, and we are hoping to do that. We are oh so close. The problem with these is that there is no manual for the perforators because they were custom built. So we have to do this all through a uh, trial and error version. And because it runs off of pneumatics, which is an air-based system, um, it's literally testing all of the wires to make sure there's no leaks and then making sure they're in the right holes, which is all trial as well. Next, uh, next slide, please. Wonderful. So we do have some questions. Um, I just saw another one come in about the QRS rolls. So QRS was uh, a company that purchased the uh, ability to make piano rolls. So piano rolls are just different enough from the barrel organ ones that they need a different type of machine for it. So we can't make QRS roll or we can't make piano rolls here. Um, do I have any? Yeah, um, we have a functioning uh, Wurlitzer uh, player piano. It's a 1922 home player piano. I also have a Nickelodeon that we're restoring. Um, I have over 130 roll, uh, QRS rolls that can be played on that. Um, when, uh, when we have one of our volunteers here that can help you, we actually allow guests to play that uh, machine. 
um, to this day. Um, actually, he's here today um, for the next 20 minutes as we're open. Um, but uh, Brant is he's a local uh, high school student, actually, um, from the uh, Humesville area um, that loves these organs. And we've been able to uh, teach him how to do these things. And he really helps us out with those. So I have 130 QRS roles. Um, and then I have um, roles from other companies as well. So I have some European ones that still that fit on the World Sir Piano that we use, um, which has some really cool opera stuff. Um, one of his favorites uh, is actually the national anthem of Austria-Hungary, which is a march. It's kind of really weird to play on a piano, but it's really fun to listen to. Um, and he also has an assortment of the uh, of the musical and opera Carmen um, that he, that we also play quite frequently. Um, so we do have some of the QRS roles, yes. Awesome, Ian. Thank you. I'm seeing a couple more questions that are back up in the queue. Is that okay if I go to them? Please do. Okay, so this is back kind of towards the beginning. We have how many items are on each carousel? So that's a great question. It depends on what we consider items um, and it depends on which carousel. So carousels can come, um, I would kind of say for the Tonawanda ones and North Tonawanda ones, there's three models. Um, so there is, and it comes with how many, uh, how many horses are on there. It's how many horses are abreast or how many rows. So there's the two abreast, three abreast and four abreast. Um, the museum has a traveling three abreast, which is all jumping horses. We have 36 horses on our carousel here that you guys can ride when you come visit us. We have a uh, chariot, which is just a normal sit in the sleigh chariot and ride around for those that don't like to go up and down. And then we also have what is called a lover's tub. So the lover's tub is actually a teacup um, that is on the carousel. So it actually spins as the whole thing spins. So it's a double spinning motion. It is not for the faint of heart, and it's one that I tend to stay away from. They're called lover's tubs because originally at the turn of the century, when you wanted, went on a date, you were supervised. You weren't allowed to have any physical contact. But if you got on this thing and started spinning, you'd get closer and closer and closer until you actually had physical contact with this person. Um, so Alan Herschel really called them spinning tubs until he heard some of his employees going, oh, yeah, my, you know, my wife went down there and they're calling it the lover's tub down at the park. And he goes, well, how did I not think of that? So they actually rebranded it as the lover's tub actually after it came back to him that it was being nicknamed this by the public. Um, so we have so we have 38 different ways to ride our carousel as a traveling three abreast. Um, the uh, two abreast ones could have 24 horses. You could have as many as 40 animals to ride on. Um, when it comes to items on there, um, our carousel also has 488 separate light bulbs on it. Um, it has, let me see if I can do some math here. You're putting me on the spot. It's got 12 different, or it's got 12 shields on the top for the rounding boards. Um, those are done for the cardinal direction. So there's four different ones, north, south, east, and west styled uh, shields. Um, we have 12 of those. Um, and then we have uh, six paintings and six mirrors that are on the inside part of the carousel that you can see as you ride around. So we've got a lot of things, depending on which things we're talking about. Um, you know, uh, and also these carousels are meant to move. They're meant to be taken apart and go from place to place. So technically the entire thing is made of things that can all be boxed up, put into two rail cars and shipped anywhere. Uh, but that's a really great question. I've never had a phrase that way before. Wow, thanks Ian. That was such great description for us. The next thing I'm seeing is enjoyed a tour of Herschel back in the nineties and still have a Christmas ornament of a carousel horse I hang every year. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, so the museum has been, uh, has been around since 1983. Um, it was actually put together by a group of just volunteers. Um, most of them were teachers or uh, local uh, history buffs or North Tonawandans who saw this building that was decaying and said, we need to do something. 
Um, so we've been around since 1983. I will tell you that um, it has changed quite a bit since then. Um, we have been a full time, uh, well, not full, we've been a full time professional staff since 2015. I still rely on volunteers. If any of you liked what I heard today and said, hey, let me get in on some of that, uh, please contact us, give us a call. My, uh, my email is on there. You can look at our museum as well, which is just carouselmuseum.org there. And, um, and come and help out. I've got over 50 volunteers that operate rides, help restore stuff, work with kids, do all kinds of things. If you want to help, I'll find something for you to do. Um, so we now, uh, since the 90s, we have been able to open Kittyland, which is four children's rides outside that we actually allow people to, or allow children to ride when it's not raining like it is today. Um, and uh, that includes the helicopters, the kitty boats, the cars, and the pony carts. And for my friends that are from Niagara County, you might recognize them because three of the four came from a local amusement park um, called the Whistle Pig, which was in Niagara Falls. So I hear all the time a lot of, uh, that those, oh, uh, I brought my grandchild to ride it today, but I wrote it. Or, you know, my, I wrote it and now my daughter's riding it. It's a really cool family thing to be able to keep these rides local and have them being able to be ridden again. Um, now, about the uh, ornaments. If you're looking for a new one, our carvers actually carve uh, wooden ornaments every year and uh, sell them in our gift shop at the museum. Uh, you can actually get them uh, in person, or we also can actually do it online now and ship them to you as well. Um, and we do Santas. Um, they do little uh, carousel themed ones as well. But the, uh, the little Santas and the little Christmas trees that are car historically carved out of wood, um, those, are, those are some of my favorite. I have one of each on my uh, tree every year. Oh, that sounds so neat. Thanks, Ian. Of course. It's my we pleasure. Have a couple comments in here. I'm not sure if you're seeing them, so I'll read them if that's okay. Of course. Uh, we have, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Really enjoyed it. And your museum will be bringing visiting family next week. Wonderful. So we are open Wednesday through Sunday, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Wednesday through Saturday. And Sundays we're open noon to 3. Any questions on that, give us a call. More than happy to talk to you. Um, at, at any time for that. And if those hours don't really work, give me a call too. I'm pretty flexible. Um, so it's it's not a problem with that. And I'm great to uh, hear that we're bringing other people around. Um, we are a small museum. We're very proud of what we do, but word of mouth and having you tell your friends and family if they're from here or not um, is really important to us. So we really appreciate that. Thank you. Definitely. And this last thing that I'm seeing is this is a wonderful preservation success story. We're so proud it's in our own backyard too. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. I, I could not do this without you guys and without all of my volunteers. So if it was just me in, in this giant building by myself um, with no funding, it would never get done. So the public wants this stuff taken care of and wants it to stay in your backyard. And I have the people that are willing to volunteer their time to help me. I am more than willing to do it. Um, so I'm very proud of being part of this. Um, if we don't have any other questions, I will tell uh, Crystal Beach family stories now. We're okay with that. We have one question and then how about that? Is that okay? Excellent. Let's do that. All right. This is, did you also put up horses in Tonawanda? Oh, great question. No. So what they're referring to is the, uh, is the carousel horses in NT, which we actually didn't do either. Um, there are a couple of horses in Tonawanda. They are uh, actually down on the ground. Those were done as a beautification project by the town of Tonawanda. The town of North Tonawanda actually put, I believe originally it was over a dozen um, uh, carousel horses on poles over 20 feet in the air at certain intersections in the, at the, uh, um, in the city. We are known as the home of the carousel for the re for a reason, um, but what they actually did is that they painted these animals according to contest winners from the local high school art group at the time. So half of them were done in specific areas or specific memorial things, but most of them were actually done and chose the paint colors and paint schemes 
on what the local uh, school children actually were, uh, what drew and painted at the time. So we're really proud of them. Uh, but even though we were the inspiration for them, we actually didn't have any say in how they were done. And we didn't, we weren't really uh, involved in that from my understanding. It was also before my time. Gotcha. Thank you, Ian. All right, on to your stories, please. Sure. So um, what you may not notice is that um, I am from the area. I'm from Genesee County. Um, so from not too far from here. Um, do love the area. My father is actually Canadian and grew up next to Crystal Beach. So even though I was never able to attend Crystal Beach, I have a lot of documentation and a lot of really cool stuff here about Crystal Beach. Um, but all of my stories are from them. Uh, so my father is the youngest of four. His next closest sibling is 16 years older than him. And to ride some of these rides, he would go with his mother, my loving grandma, Millie, um, and they would go and ride and ride the rides. Um, the one problem with that is that my grandmother would get motion sickness looking at a bicycle. So um she actually would ride these rides and one of them is the little dipper roller coaster if any of you ever rode that it's a really cool roller coaster i actually have it here at the museum um it is not being run currently but we do have it, the crystal beach little dipper at the museum um and uh, my grandmother and father rode this and i actually have photos of my father and grandma millie riding this exact a roller coaster that I walk past every day. Um, the photograph is uh, my six, seven, eight year old father with his hands in the air, very excited. Woo! Um, and my grandmother uh, getting sick over the side. Um, I told this story and my mother said, how dare you do that? Grandma Millie would not want you to tell this story. And I said, well, she, she, was, she was two things. Um, one, she was someone uh, that loved making other people laugh. Um, and as I can tell, most of you do that when I tell that story. Check one. Great. She loved that. Check two. The only thing my grandmother loved more than a cleanly swept porch was her family. Um, and this story showcases that even though she knew she was going to have a bad time, she was willing to do this for her son to enjoy himself. Um, and that's one of the main things that amusement is about, is about these stories and these times with our families and these uh, amazing moments that we could share with people that are not with us anymore or memories we can make with people that after we're long gone, they're gonna hold them in their thoughts and in their minds. Um, my grandmother has been gone for almost a decade, but she is always with me because I walk past this, care, this, uh, this amusement ride every day. And also because I talk about her most days with these rides. Um, so, uh, Crystal Beach is very important to us here at the museum, just like it is to a lot of you that probably wrote it and were there with your family. So thank you for tell letting me tell you that story. Ian, thank you for sharing that with us. That just gave me such a warm feeling in my heart. Thank you. It's, it's my pleasure. So, you know, I, we're, we're here up at the museum. I'd love to see you guys again. Um, I'm more than willing to come to a bunch of other organizations and do presentations as well. I'm not the only person. So if you're like, well, I like the information, but you know, he's not my type of speaker. I've got all kinds of people that are more than willing to talk to you that have different expertises that have different stories that would love to share this information with you. So I just thank you guys for taking time out of this rainy day today to, to, uh, spend time with me when you could have done a myriad of other things. Well, we thank you, Ian, and congratulations on your new official title. That's very exciting. Thank you. And um, to everyone who's on, we appreciate you. Thank you for your time, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone.